In this video, I'm going to do another example of finding the derivative of an inverse function. Here, I'm going to look for the inverse, the derivative of the inverse function of the sine of x. Okay, so before we start, let's just do a quick refresher on the sine of x. So if f of x is the sine of x, when we want to take inverses, uh, remember in the previous video, I mentioned uh, one of the constraints here, and that is if you have uh, many outputs, or if you have different x values that give you the same output. For example, with x squared, we had that 2 gives you 4 and minus 2 gives you 4. We had to restrict, in order to find an inverse, we wanted to be able to go back from 4 and find a single value. We have to restrict our function and not think of it as broad of a function as it actually is. And in the case of x squared, we were looking for an inverse that did not uh, give us negative values. So in the case of the sine function, we're going to have to do the same, but it's a little bit more complicated. So let me draw the graph of the sine function. Here's x, and I will draw the sine function like this. And this here is pi, and this is pi over 2, and this is 1 sine of x. Okay, so the problem here is we have a value of um, a value of x, many values of x here that will evaluate to the same value at different x values. So if we were going to try and invert the sine of x, that means we pick a value here and say what number came from that value. We would have to highlight all the ones and there'd be more of them out here and so on. And we don't want that because we want our inverse function to be a function. And so what we need to do is we need to slice this sine function up into pieces and only deal with the piece where the inverse is going to be a well-defined function. So the way we do that is we, in this case, so the, I guess the simple way the simple way to decide on an interval, and you can actually choose whatever interval you want, but the traditional one for sine of x and other similar ones is to um, go to the origin and see how far can I go in the positive direction before I run into trouble. And you can see I run into trouble right here because as soon as I curve around this bend, there's going to be two different values on either side of that maximum. And so I can go all the way out to pi over 2 without any issue. And then can I go anywhere in the opposite direction? Yeah, I can. I can go all the way to minus pi over 2. And so this entire section, let me make this a thicker line, everything between here and here will have a well-defined inverse function. If I allow my x values to go beyond that, I'm going to run into trouble inverting it. Okay. So uh, what that says is we're going to look for an inverse function on, well, the values of the inverse are going to bring me back to minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. But the values that I input, so the inverse function is going to be defined on, and I can go all the way from minus 1 to 1, and I can include the ends because I have a well-defined inverse even at those ends. Inverse function on with, and the range of this inverse function is only going to go from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. Now some people will denote the inverse function as sine inverse. I don't like that notation because we have another sort of terrible notation, which is sine squared of x. Sine squared of x means sine of x all squared. Now that already is a bit of an awkward definition because traditionally in mathematics, sine squared of x in other cases, not sine, that would be interpreted as the sine of, whoops, the sine of the sine of x. But we do not interpret it, this sine squared as this one. We interpret it as this one. So there's this terrible confusion of notation. And because this looks like a minus 1, you might confuse this with it being 1 over sine x, which it is not. This is a reciprocal, not a function inverse. 
So you'll notice I haven't put equal signs where there are incorrect equal signs to put. So you will not see me use the notation sine to the minus one, or really this is actually sine to the minus bar. This is just a vertical line, but everybody calls it a one because that's what it looks like. Okay, so I'm gonna erase all that. And now that's gonna just hopefully explain to you why I use, instead of the sine to the minus bar, I use arc sine x to denote the inverse function. Okay, so what is the derivative of arc sine x? So uh, if we have y equal the arc sine, oops, arc sine of x, the first thing I want to do is I want to write that in an inverted way, which means write it in terms of what we know is true of, of inverse functions. If I take the sine of both sides, I have the sine of y is equal to the sine of the arc sine of y, of x on this side, which when I plug arc sine into, keep on forgetting that C, arc sine into the sine function, I just get x because they are inverses of one another. And now I have an expression and I know the derivative of both of these things with respect to x. So remember here, y is implicitly there hiding of a function of x. And so when I take the derivative on the left-hand side, I get the cosine of y of x but the chain rule tells me I have to multiply by y prime. And on the other side, I just get one. And so I have y prime of x is equal to one over the cosine of y of x. Now with the logarithm function, we had the exponential of the logarithm here. And that, just because the derivative of exponential is exponential, that ended up being a very simple expression. We just ended up with x back. But here we have the cosine of y. And it would be nice if we could write down the derivative of y, not in terms of y itself, but in terms of the independent variable only, x. And with a little bit of work, it turns out that we can. So how do we do that? Well, we appeal back to the triangle, or you can do this on the unit circle as well. It's probably more general to do it there, but it's easier to draw here. And so if I'm dealing with something where x is equal to the sine of y, the angle then, so here I have x is equal to the sine of y. The angle is y, so I'm gonna put a y in this corner here. And the sine of y is the opposite over the hypotenuse. So I'm going to put x over one because the sine of y is x over one. So I can interpret this as the opposite and the one as the hypotenuse. And now here I'm looking for the cosine of y. And so all I need to do is fill in my triangle and I'll get the cosine. There's a right angle here and that means that this side is going to be one squared minus x squared. And if you don't see that, uh, you can put a placeholder here like a and then you know that a squared plus x squared has to be equal to one and now solve for a and you should get what I wrote down. Okay, so now I can write down what the cosine of y is. The cosine of y should just be the adjacent over the hypotenuse, but it goes in the denominator, so that's going to be the hypotenuse over the adjacent in, in the end. And so what I end up with is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. And that is the derivative of arc sine. So I can now write that d dx of the arc sine of x is equal to one over the square root of one minus x squared. So this method now has given us the log, the derivative of the log function, and it's also now given us the derivative of arc sine of x, which is the inverse of sine. You can do on your own, you can do the arc, the arc cosine and any other um, trig function whose inverse you'd like to find a derivative for.